Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am about to share my screen with you. So, uh, well, I'm already sharing it, but I'm about to hit present mode. And this is chapter three. Normally, we take a couple of weeks to go over chapter three. And um, I am going to split this lecture up into two parts. I believe there's about 33 slides on here. So I'll do the first maybe 18 or so, and then I will split it up and do part two um, a little bit later. At the time that I'm recording this, um, I want to make sure that I'm available for my two o'clock office hours uh, virtually. So I will record the first part and then probably record the second part afterwards, just in case there's not enough time. Um, the nice thing about this class is, like I said, I have this class as an online class, so I gave you all of the information that I gave them. Um, I didn't necessarily change around um, due dates or anything like that for assignments, so I will continue to do that, and you don't have to worry. I will give announcements when things are due and stuff like that. Um, so let's start with Chapter 3. Um, presumably you'll be watching this after you've taken the first exam and the answers will be up on Friday so you can check uh, and see what you got right and maybe what you missed. Um, yeah, here we go. Once it works, there we go. Did I? Yeah, sometimes it's just slow to respond. So, we have our nervous system. Uh, in this chapter, we've already gone over um, before this, obviously, the history and origins of biopsychology, as well as how neurons and the nervous system communicates and how it's in charge of every single little thing that we do. So in this, I'm just giving you an overview. When we um, skip back to chapter three, we're gonna go over the parts of the brain, the lobes of the brain, um, and all of the little things that, uh, little structures that make up the brain. What's in each of these areas of the brain? What's in these lobes? Things like that. So first we start with an overview of our nervous system. And our nervous system is composed of two separate nervous systems. The central nervous system, which are um, tracks and I, I don't think you can see it. It's supposed to say nuclei, but the central nervous system, which is just made up of the brain and spinal cord. system. That's where it begins and ends. It's the brain and the spinal cord and everything contained in it. The rest of our nervous system com uh, comprises the peripheral nervous system, which as you can see um, is split up into two sub nervous systems, one called the somatic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system consists of the motor neurons that leave the brain and spinal cord and go down to the muscles and glands as well as the sensory neurons from outside of the central nervous system that carry information up to the brain so that we know about our five senses. And we will talk about three of the five senses in the third module after the second exam, which will be chapters 9, 10, and 11. So the somatic nervous system is composed of motor neurons that go outside of the central nervous system, and sensory neurons that start from outside and go into the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, we have different names for things as we'll talk about as we go through this chapter, or at least I'll talk about. Um, a bundle of nerves in the central nervous system was known as a tract. Outside in the peripheral nervous system, you know these as nerves. So anytime we talk about pinched nerves or um, getting on our nerves <laughs> or just nerves that we have in our body, it is a bundle of axons carrying information um, in the peripheral nervous system. So um, a cluster of cells in the central nervous system is what we call a nucleus or nuclei. In the peripheral nervous system, like the autonomic nervous system, 
we call them ganglion or ganglia if there's more than one. One cluster of cell bodies is called a ganglion, G-A-N-G-L-I-O-N, and more than one is ganglia, like nucleus and nuclei. And so the other portion of the peripheral nervous system that you guys are familiar with, because um, this is in every psych one class, is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic is what we call or what I like to call the fight or flight system, which includes um, dilating pupils so you can see more, more voluntary control to the skeletal muscles so that you can either stay and fight or run away, increased heartbeat and respiration, um, and of course, uh, releasing adrenaline from the hormones. Um, and it also stops digestion so that you can use as much energy as possible to either stay and fight or run away from any sign of danger. But if we kept uh, in a sympathetic state of arousal the whole time, our neurons would poop out and die, and uh, we wouldn't last very long. So we need a system in place in order to sort of bring us back down to normal. That's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. I like to call that the rest and digest system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest system which basically undoes everything the sympathetic nervous system does. So it stops adrenaline from flowing. It um, constricts the pupils back to normal. It starts digestion up again and brings our energy reserves back to a normal spot. And it calms down our breathing and heart rate and things like that. So the parasympathetic nervous system is basically undoing and bringing us back to a normal resting state uh, to undo what the sympathetic nervous system has us do in any sign of danger. And yes, folks, that's how it works for anxiety as well. Um, so again, looking at a bundle of axons in the central nervous system, we call it a tract. Um, in the peripheral system, nervous system, we call it nerves. So we have nerves that go to the brain, which we call cranial nerves from our five senses. And we have the nerves that go up through the spinal cord which connect to the spinal cord, we call those spinal nerves. Obviously, we have spinal nerves that go to every muscle in the body because they are coordinated through the um, brain, um, brain stem and the spinal cord. A group of cell bodies in the central nervous system is called a nucleus, and so plural of that would be nuclei, and there are many different clusters of uh, cell bodies, many different nuclei in the um, certain parts of the brain. The amygdala, which is the fear and rage center of the brain, contains three main nuclei um, that composes the amygdala. In the peripheral nervous system, again, ganglion or ganglia. So we have the sympathetic ganglion chain uh, and the parasympathetic ganglion chain that counteracts the sympathetic one, as I just talked about. Um, when we're um, looking at the brain, we have to think from an evolutionary perspective first, that the old brain, the stuff underneath that big beautiful cortex, um, was evolutionarily the first to develop. And when we evolved into human beings, um, through the process of evolution, we grew a bigger and better and more complex cortex. That's what separates us from the animals. But what about when we are developing in the womb from fetus um, or a fetus, I guess you would say? Well, when the nervous system is developed, the brain actually starts out, or the nervous system, brain and spinal cord, central nervous system, starts out as a hollow tube or tubular structure. So we call it the neural tube. Um, as you can see, on the right, we see a little bit of the tube starting to form at about three weeks into three main parts plus the spinal cord. A forebrain, which is going to turn into the cortex and some structures just underneath it. In green, we have a midbrain, which um, is right in the middle of the brain in the center. And we have a hindbrain, which is going to um, turn into what eventually becomes the pons, the medulla, and the cerebellum. And then of course below it, the bottom of the tube becomes the spinal cord. 
it is uh, good to know for your benefit that at three weeks and even at seven weeks, we see the nervous system developing, but there's not actually a heartbeat yet. And the only reason I bring this up uh, is because of certain laws in Alabama and Arkansas that have been put into place um, for uh, abortion laws, um, which is controversial, of course, the whole nature of it. And um, that the law that was put in, I think it was about a year ago now, um, was that they called it the six week heartbeat rule, that if you can detect a heartbeat, which they say doctors can do at six weeks, um, then they are no longer allowed to perform abortions because the baby has a heartbeat. Well, let me be the first to tell you, uh, if not the first, at least, you know, one of the first um, on this topic, that the heartbeat doesn't even develop, isn't even detectable until after week eight. So anything at three weeks or seven weeks here or anything at six weeks that uh, lawmakers say that doctors can hear are electromagnetic pulses that come from that um, ultrasound system. So even though it may sound like a heartbeat, it's actually just an electromagnetic pulse that's not actually the heartbeat because we won't get a fully formed heart to be able to beat until at least after eight weeks. So I just wanted to point that out because I do that in class anyway. Um, but as you can see from the chart at three weeks, the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain are about the same um, size, just as the tube itself was the same size before that. And at about seven weeks, we see the midbrain um, and the hindbrain are still relatively the same size, but the forebrain starts to bubble out and become a little bit bigger. And by 11 weeks, the forebrain is taking its place at the top of the food chain as far as the brain goes. The forebrain becomes the largest part, the hindbrain is going to become the second largest, and the midbrain is the only one that basically stays the same size uh, the whole time. And uh, in any outside view of the brain, as you see at birth, you can see the hindbrain underneath, you can see the big beautiful cortex of the forebrain, um, and you can't see the midbrain because it's kind of stuck literally in the middle of the brain. So um, the lower tube becomes what we now know as the spinal cord. The upper tube develops into the three sections, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain of the um, of the brain itself, right? So yes, those are your three sections of the brain. Forebrain, which includes the cortex and subcortical structures. Subcortical meaning just under the cortex. Midbrain is in the middle of the brain and the hindbrain is going to be the section that is the pons, the medulla, and the cerebellum behind it, as you can see in purple. Um, come on, there we go. So if we were to look inside the brain, because in order to understand structure and function, um, a lot of times we take slices of the brains. Uh, we do this in a lot of times if we're looking at the brains of patients that have died due to some sort of brain problem or if they had some sort of history of it and we wanted to see if there was something going on in the brain. It's the easiest way to look at the structure of the brain. Of course, in an, in an alive person, we use scans to do that now, MRIs to look at structure using magnets. Um, we can read brain waves through what we call EEG, electroencephalogram, um, and uh, PET scans and CTs. But um, in order to understand the structure of the brain, um, and back in the day, we took slices. So looking at the cortex itself in the forebrain, um, the largest part of the brain, of course, is this forebrain, which mostly contains the cerebral cortex. Underneath the cortex, you can see some of the structures and some of the holes in the brain as well. So the largest part of the brain has um, the cortex, and the cortex comes in two sides. There is a left half and a right half, and we call those halves the cerebral hemispheres. And what separates them through the middle is something that we call the longitudinal fissure. So first of all, let's get some terminology right. A, uh, the cortex itself has ridges, bumps, 
and it has little hills or valleys, right? Um, the cortex is wrinkled to increase surface area. So if anybody tried to tell me that I had a big brain, I don't really take that as a compliment as a neuroscientist because um, your brain size could be relative to your head size. Um, and brains, if they grew out, would impinge upon the skull and probably cause problems. So in order to do this, when we learn something new, when we perfect a skill or get better at something, we're building connections, stronger connections, more connections, and the brain is making itself kind of more wrinkly. So if somebody were to tell me I had a really wrinkly brain, as a neuroscientist, now I take that as a compliment. Man, your brain is really wrinkly. Thank you. Um, you wouldn't want to hear that about your skin, maybe, but your brain, good stuff. So the bumps or ridges in the brain are referred to as gyruses or gyri, plural. So one of the bumps is called a gyrus. Um, those are the bumps you see there. Um, any of the, the little grooves in between the bumps are what we call a sulcus, or again, in um, plural form, sulci. And those little grooves separates lobes and um, separates areas of the brain that are raised, so, so, uh, 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 separates the gyri. Um, you notice that some of them are called fissures, right? So we have grooves and then we have the really deep grooves. So there's um, the lateral fissure on the left-hand side. You can see a sulcus is just a little small valley, but the lateral fissure leads to a much bigger hole. So the bigger holes, the longitudinal fissures, as you can see, there's a giant gap in between the two hemispheres, except where that white matter pathway called the corpus callosum is. And there is um, a larger hole um, that separates the frontal lobe from sort of the temporal lobe, which is called the lateral fissure. And you can see that leads to a bigger hole or a bigger valley. So the little ones, the little grooves are called sulcuses or sulci, and the bigger deep grooves are called fissures, where the bumps are all just called gyri or a gyrus. separate sort of the front half from the back half of the brain. So you're cutting through right down the middle. Um, not separating the hemispheres, but down the middle the opposite way. Um, and you may notice that uh, there are a few structures maybe sort of under the crown part, sort of in the middle near where it says the anterior commissure. Just to the right and left of the anterior commissure um, would be your thalamus. Um, four of the five senses go through the thalamus, as we'll talk about. And below that, the um, hypothalamus, which is a very important structure in the brain, as we'll talk about, and we'll spend a lot of chapter six, majority of chapter six, talking about. Um, but it doesn't get a cool name. Hypo means below, so it's just the name of that structure that's located right below the thalamus. It doesn't even get its own cool name, like hippocampus or amygdala or something like that. So um, the other thing that I wanted to point out in this slide is that uh, uh, across the outer edges of the brain, what you see is darker material that makes up that crown or corona. Sometimes we call it corona radiata, radiating crown, um, which comes from the darker color. On the inside, especially where you see the corpus callosum and you see the uh, more gray or whitish matter, that's what we call white matter. In the um, brain, what we see is that the dark or gray matter is on the outside and the white matter seems to be more on the inside. When we go to look at the spinal cord, what you'll find is it's exactly the opposite, that the gray matter is actually located on the inner portion and that the white matter is what's sort of on the outside or on the periphery. Um, so what are these gray matter and white matter portions of the brain? Well, the gray matter is made up of cell bodies and the dendrites that extend from them. 
Um, and we call that gray matter because under a slide, the material for the cell bodies with their nuclei and the dendrites looks very dark. Um, so it's called gray matter. The white matter is the axons of these neurons. And um, remember what covers the axons? I'm sure you do, that lovely myelin. So myelin has that sort of white or off-white eggshell-like color that gives white matter its name. So white matter pathways are the axons that are taking information from one part of the brain to another or to um, different areas like the muscles or gathering information from coming up from the five senses. The corpus callosum itself, as you can see, directly connects the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So what the corpus callosum is specific for is transferring information between the left and right hemisphere. As I pointed out earlier in class a few weeks ago, um, our body is cross-wired. So things that uh, affect the left side of the body are actually mostly um, interpreted or they go to the right side of the brain. So the whole left side of my body is controlled by the right side of my brain. The whole right side of my body is controlled by the left side of my brain. That's why, that's right, left-handers are in their right mind. Ha! I can say that proudly as a left-hander. Um, what we also see from this picture, <laughs> as I digress, is that there are different layers and columns of cell bodies um, and that the nervous system is layered. Why are there nice columns and rows? Because if there weren't, it would be chaos. And if we have billions, not millions, but billions of neurons that are connected and um, communicating with one another all around the same time, we need our information to be organized pretty well. So these layers and columns of cell bodies um, are what allow us to be able to keep the information um, neat, I guess you'd say, and tidy. Come on. No, no, it's not wanting to do anything. There we go. So uh, I see this picture is missing, but if you um, go down to where I have all of this written out, the um, layers of the cortex, there are six layers of cells in the cortex. Um, I know you can't see it from this picture and I apologize, but like I said, if you go to the uh, down below for my online course page, um, down to the sixth uh, slide or down to um, read, read through the notes that I had written for that class, you will see that this picture comes up um, and it is um, six layers of cells and you can see that they are in nice rows and columns. Um, I don't know why for some reason that this picture doesn't come up in um, this version, but um, it's really just one picture, so you can check it out yourself. It just shows further proof that the brain is organized very nicely in columns and rows. And in fact, um, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, in fact, uh, we uh, look at movies like Inside Out, where they don't always have the neuroscience right, and it's Disney, there's no obligation to do that, but they did show memories and, and the sort of um, little neurons in nice columns and rows. They had them on a shelf, right, or shelves. So at least that part was appropriate, and that made me happy when I saw the movie. Um, Again, we asked the questions about brain size relative to uh, intelligence. And um, it begs the question, do intelligent individuals have bigger brains? Well, as I said, if you told me I had a bigger brain than somebody else, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and uh, if you look at a human's body size compared to a bigger animal like an elephant, or uh, especially the biggest animal of all, blue whale, Brain size is mostly related to our body size because if we have larger bodies, we have more muscles that are innervated and we know one of the big main tasks of our brain is to control our movements and our muscles. So an animal that's bigger has more muscles and so they may need a bigger brain to be able to control that. So elephants and sperm whales tend to have 
brains that are five to six times larger than us humans. But does that mean that they're more intelligent than us? No, of course not. They can't use tools. They can't communicate through language and non-language abilities. They do have their own sort of, you know, ways that whales speak or elephants speak, but it's not the same as a human. We are definitely more complex. And if you were to go into their brains and take them out or to scan them, you would see that they do not have the nice big wrinkly cortex that we have that allows us to do these things. We can also plan out our days, weeks in advance. Although right now mine is staying home, staying home, staying home. So um, animals can't do that. I just know that my dog is happy that I'm not leaving every day. So among humans, there is a small and highly variable correlation between brain size and intelligence which we'll talk about. So again, saying that I have a bigger brain is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, that could be a bad thing because there is a disorder when there's too much uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the brain called hydrocephalus. We'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, but that actually is a bad sign. And that needs to be, uh, a stent usually needs to be put into the brain so that some of that fluid can drain. Um, and the brain isn't so big, because that's a bad thing. So looking at these animals, as I said, um, when we talk about intelligence and the way that the brain is structured, the more wrinkly the brain, the more intelligent the creature. So when, when we look at the um, cerebral cortex or the forebrain itself, what we see is that um, the cortex has more convolutions or more wrinkles, um, and that cerebral hemispheres are larger in proportion than other brain areas. So if you look to the top right, you'll see a picture of an armadillo brain. You can see that there is a wrinkly portion, but that's more the cerebellum, which coordinates specific movements. So um, the forebrain itself isn't much bigger than the hindbrain here, um, brain stem and cerebellum, and it's very smooth. We call that lissen cephalic, L-I-S-S-E-N, cephalic. Cephalic means brain. Lissen means smooth. So smooth brain creatures like armadillos, they can have, you know, some complex movements, but um, their brain is pretty, pretty smooth. Uh, when you look at a monkey, a monkey is very close to us, and especially a chimpanzee, which is, which is even more wrinkly. As you see, we see increasing complexity um, as you get closer to the forebrain. So um, this is an evolutionary thing. All animals and humans that are mammals and have a spine, vertebrates, um, share these same structures, at least the brainstem, the um, midbrain, and the subcortical structures. And they have a lot of the same genes and things like that. So rats and mice are actually about 90% similar in genetic structure. Um, they're pretty similar in the brain structures, uh, at least the lower brain structures that we have, not quite the um, cerebral hemisphere. Monkeys are a lot more similar to us, and especially the chimpanzee, which is about 98.6, 98.7% similar to humans. So although most animal researchers or research activists don't like the fact that we use higher animals like monkeys in our research, it makes a lot of sense because those are the closest to humans. And in fact, there have been some chimpanzees, um, like I think Coco that just passed away last year or the year before, that was able to actually communicate with humans via sign language. And Coco learned, she learned over 150 words of sign language when, and was actually able to have basically conversations with um, the researchers. So although we tend to try to use mice and rats when we can, if we really need to know more about specifics in brain circuitry and we need a brain model that is um, a lot more um, similar to ours as humans, then we tend to use um, higher order monkeys, higher order animals like monkeys that have brains very similar to us. Um, the next thing that I wanted to go over is directions in the brain. Um, when we look at how we are 
labeling things. Um, one of the things you noticed was um, a structure that we talked about, which we'll get into more detail a little later, called the hypothalamus. And hypo is one of those things that means below. So when researchers and scientists um, were trying to figure out how to um, decide where in the brain we were looking at when we're making slices or talking about where things are located, they had to use certain terminology. So um, I'm going to go over some of those. The first one on the left says dorsal versus ventral. And as you see here um, in A, dorsal is sort of on the top side of the brain and ventral is on the bottom side of the brain going down towards the um, spinal cord. Dorsal uh, may sound familiar to you because of the dorsal fin of a shark, which is sticking up out of the water. Um, and these, uh, these directions were made for humans up on two legs, but you can also think about it for animals on four legs or um, creatures that don't have legs like fish, sharks, things like that. So dorsal would be the top of the shark. That's the part that's sticking out of the water. So for animals on four legs or animals that swim, right, that's more of a hor uh, horizontal where we are up on two legs and we are more vertical. So up on top is dorsal, which is, you know, kind of like also meaning towards the back because the dorsal fin sticks out of the back of the shark. And ventral is towards the stomach, right? The ventral, the bottom end, is where the animal's tummies are. So ventral is the bottom side uh, for the human brain and dorsal is towards the top side. Um, and you could think of the ventral side, the bottom side as closer to the stomach, right? Even though we're up on two legs and not horizontal. Um, anterior versus posterior is the second one. Um, anterior means front or in front of or in the front. So the, the closer you get towards the front, um, where the frontal lobe is, that's the anterior portion of the brain, where in the back of the brain, towards the back of the head, is the posterior part. Sometimes people's butts are referred to as their posterior ends. So the back of the brain, the back end, is what we call posterior, towards the back. So the occipital lobe, and underneath that, you can see the cerebellum in purple, is in the posterior part of the brain, where the frontal lobe, um, right above the eyes is in the anterior portion. Um, lateral versus medial, we can see on the right side of A. And um, medial means the middle. So anything that goes down that midline of the brain separating the hemispheres, right? We talked about the um, fissure right in there that separates the left and right hemispheres, right? Or the lateral fissure, which separates the front top from the bottom half of the brain. Um, anything towards the middle along that midline where you can see um, in the middle, right down that line, anything towards the middle is medial and anything towards the ends, remember the corona radiata, the um, outline of the uh, slice of the brain, the coronal cut is uh, anything towards the outside is lateral. I think of lateral movement side to side so anything out towards the sides is what we call more lateral. So anything on the surface of the cortex is gonna be lateral. Anything sort of inside is going to be medial towards the middle of the brain. And the last one says superior and inferior. Superior is kind of like hyper and hypo. They both mean the same thing. So if something is hyper to something else, it's above it. Hypo, like the hypothalamus is below it. These words are interchangeable but we use superior and inferior. Superior is above, so towards the top, and inferior is below, towards the bottom. Can you use superior and inferior um, interchangeably with dorsal and ventral? Probably, but when we say superior and inferior, we're usually talking about to each other. In the midbrain, when we get to that portion of the slides, you're going to see that there are two little nuclei called colliculi in the midbrain. There is a superior colliculus, which is the one on top, and an inferior colliculus, which is the one on the bottom. Um, and it's just, superior just means it's the one on top, and inferior just means it's the one on the bottom. Um, they both play a role in the 
auditory and visual system pathways. Um, and we'll talk about that way later. Um, more like chapters nine and 10. Um, so be ready for that. Uh, so those are the directions in the brain. Dorsal is towards the back or top end, like the dorsal fin sticking out of the water of a shark. Ventral is towards the belly or the bottom end of the brain. Anterior is towards the front, posterior is towards the back. Lateral is on the outsides, medial is in the middle. Superior above and inferior below, or you can think of hyper and hypo, usually in reference to another part of the brain. The thalamus is superior to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is inferior to the thalamus, right? Things like that. The last thing that we want to look at on this page is the sections. When we make sections of the brain to cut, we can cut to separate front half from the back half, which is the coronal cut. Again, you're cutting right through both hemispheres of the brain, separating it into basically front and back halves. In this, you can see the inside of the brain pretty well. So you can see the outside being lateral and the inside being medial. That's this first cut here. Um, and you can also, of course, see dorsal and ventral, dorsal towards the top and ventral towards the bottom of the brain. You can also see holes in the brain during this coronal cut, which we call ventricles. And we'll get into that later in this chapter as well. Um, this artist's rendering of the coronal cut um, makes it really easy to see the difference between the gray matter around the sides on the lateral side and the white matter, which is um, a little more medial in this case. So LM is lateral medial, DV would be dorsal ventral. Um, another cut that is very, very um, familiar in neuroscience is the sagittal cut, which basically separates the brain the opposite way into left and right halves. So in order to see some of these subcortical structures that you can actually see in, the, uh, in this cut, which we call a sagittal, sometimes it's called a mid-sagittal cut because you're cutting right through the middle of the brain, right through the corpus callosum um, and things like that. Um, and this separates it into left and right hemispheres. You can see the corpus callosum, that big white matter band of axons right below the cortex. Um, and you can see through things like the brain stem, the cerebellum, um, and it can reveal structures of the brain like um, thalamus and hypothalamus and things like that. In this case, you see anterior and posterior as opposed to lateral and medial. Um, and you can still see dorsal and ventral top and bottom sides. The last one is the most rare of the cuts, which separates the brain into top half and bottom half in a horizontal way. So that cut, as it's not very cleverly named, is a horizontal cut. In a horizontal cut, which is the one that is done the least, we see the coronal and sagittal cuts all the time. You hardly ever see a horizontal cut, but if you wanted to see top half versus bottom half of the brain, you can look at that this way. It's a, it's a different way to look at some of the white matter pathways as you can see on the right hand side of B at the bottom. The horizontal, you can see anterior and posterior parts of the brain, anterior on the left and posterior on the right. And of course, it allows you to see lateral and medial pretty well, lateral towards the outside of the brain and medial towards the middle. So those are the directions and the cuts of the brain. We um, are now looking at the whole brain. And of course, you can only see one part at a time. And this is where we are going to label our um, parts of the brain, at least section it off into the different lobes of the brain. And what you can see are some of the gyruses that are pointed out. Um, you can see the precentral gyrus. Remember, those are the um, hills um, of the brain and the sulcuses or sulci that are next to them. So here you see the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Pre and post um, are not necessarily interchangeable with dorsal and ventral, but they are um, close. In the same way that superior meant above and inferior means below a structure or a thing, pre means in front of and post means behind, right? We talked about this in chapter two as the presynaptic or sending cell before the synapse. 
and the postsynaptic cell, which contained the receptors and dendrites, which post meant after the synaptic gap. In this way, um, a pre-something, pre-central gyrus, means the gyrus or hunk of brain that's in front of the central sulcus, and the post-central gyrus is that hunk of brain that is behind the central sulcus, right? Also, we have a frontal lobe, and in the front of the frontal lobe, as you see there um, on top, is the prefrontal cortex. So it is the front of the frontal lobe. Um, we don't have a postfrontal cortex, so don't worry about that. So looking at some of these parts of the brain, what we see is that um, the frontal lobe contains an area on at least the left-hand side of the brain, which we'll learn more about in chapter nine, called Broca's area. This area is specific for um, speech, um, and specifically it is for um, producing speech. People who have this part of the brain damaged are no longer able to speak. If you were to ask them to speak, it would probably sound like this. <laughs> I actually uh, have a friend named Jason, and when we were in high school, we went over to Jason's grandfather's house, and Jason's grandfather had had a stroke. The stroke definitely affected the left side of the brain because although his grandfather was able to walk uh, normally, he was no longer able to speak. So we are certain, based on this, that um, the stroke, which we'll talk about what a stroke is at the end of this chapter, um, the stroke uh, affected and effectively destroyed Broca's area because his grandfather could only do this. When asked a question, he could only say this in response. They do, they do, they do, they do, they. Um, what was really amazing to me is that Jason's grandmother, after living with her grandfather for many, many, many years, seemed to understand what he was saying, even though the only actual words or lack of words that came out of his mouth were de do de do de, um, which to me, especially in high school, before I ever took a science class or a, at least a psychology class, just blew my mind. So um, that is in the frontal lobe, which means that speech has to be at least some part um, associated with the frontal lobe, but it's more associated with um, the temporal lobe um, below it. As you can see, the temporal lobe has two main areas, and you can see the lateral fissure is separating the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, which kind of sticks out like a thumb. In the temporal lobe, we have the auditory cortex, which is where sound or the auditory system is uh, interpreted by the brain as processed, and Wernicke's area right behind it. So a few years after Dr. Paul Broca um, it was discovered that people couldn't produce speech, but they could still understand it. So if I asked that person, like Jason's grandfather, do you understand what I'm saying? If you understand, nod your head. The person would be able to nod their head, and now you're probably nodding it as I'm saying this. Um, but Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe, right behind the auditory cortex, that little area in orange, was for understanding speech. So somebody else that had brain damage or maybe a stroke that affected the temporal lobe um, went to Dr. Wernicke and said, purple monkey dishwasher. So they were able to make words. The words just made no sense together. And um, in this way, the doctor said, do you understand what I'm saying? Because you're making words, but I don't know if you can understand me. And the person would give them a blank look. So when Wernicke's area is damaged, people could still talk. It just wouldn't make any sense. We, uh, call that word salad. They would just put a bunch of words together that don't mean anything. So they're still able to make and form words that make sense, but putting them together in a way that's understandable is impossible because you lose your speech comprehension. Um, so that and language function that integrates auditory and visual systems is part of that temporal lobe. So we'll get back to that. In the back of the brain, we also see um, an area called the visual cortex. Um, so for the occipital lobe, we can start there. In the bottom, you see it in pink. In the top, you also see it in pink. Uh, 
And the occipital lobe only has one job. You have one job, occipital lobe. And that job is visual information. So anything from our visual system that comes from our eyes is going to be interpreted in the occipital lobe in what we call the visual cortex. Um, but there are many aspects to that as we'll talk about in chapter 10. This includes seeing forms or shapes, seeing colors, seeing motion, right? Depth perception, all of that. So anything having to do with our visual sense, including reading words and language, right? Is going to be the occipital lobe. So one job in the occipital lobe and that is visual processing and visual information. Um, in the temporal lobe, since we just talked about it, the temporal lobe is mainly housing the auditory cortex in Wernicke's area. So um, that's where the auditory system or sound is processed, as well as language is coordinated. So hearing and language are primarily the auditory uh, cortex in the Wernicke's area are primarily the jobs of the temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is involved in language coordination and it's involved in the sense of hearing. Just inside the temporal lobe, although you can't see it from this view unless we did that sagittal cut, um, on the inside is a structure called the hippocampus, which is involved in at least temporary storage or short, what we used to refer to as short-term memory. So the temporal lobe is also involved in memory function. So memory, hearing, and uh, language coordination is the temporal lobe. Above the occipital lobe and above the temporal lobe in the back, we see the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is where we are able to pay attention to things. Um, it is where we are able to know where we are within our space, within our environment. So knowing our head position and, and movement, knowing how close or far away we are to things. Um, that is the um, parietal lobe. And one of those areas that is highlighted up top in blue is the postcentral gyrus which is the, uh, called the somatosensory cortex. So our sense of touch, which includes pressure, vibration, grip, um, knowing that what we're grabbing or, or knowing what's grabbing us, if that's the case or what's touching us, um, as well as temperature and pain. So hot and cold, whether it's the weather outside or whether you're holding something that's hot or cold and you can tell. Um, that is your sense of touch, as well as pain. And although we do not like pain, pain is our body's natural alarm system, and it lets us know that something is wrong and needs to be taken care of. So all of those things that come from the body, from the skin senses, are sent to the somatosensory cortex at the very front of the parietal lobe. Um, the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe are separated by that sulcus called the central sulcus. And right in front of that is the precentral gyrus or motor cortex. So one of the biggest things that the frontal lobe does is it controls our movements. Um, the motor cortex has areas of the cortex that correspond to each individual muscle. This is coordinated through the spinal cord where the motor cortex sends its neurons to the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, they go out to the correct individual muscles um, to allow us to do the different types of things that we can do. So the frontal lobe is responsible for our motor activities, for our movements. The uh, rest of the frontal lobe, we see Broca's area, which again is next to the motor cortex because if we are producing speech, guess what we have to do? Yes, that's right, move the muscles in our mouth and move our mouth in different ways in order to make the different sounds that constitute language. So Broca's area in the frontal lobe is connected to the motor cortex and it controls the muscles in our face and mouth um, to be able to do that, specifically our mouth for language, of course, verbal language. The rest of that frontal lobe is dedicated in green um, and it is our prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is basically our system that integrates everything from the rest of the brain. So if the visual system is in the occipital lobe and the touch system is in the uh, parietal lobe, 
if sound or audition hearing is in the temporal lobe, and I didn't say this yet, but now I will, on the underside uh, near the lateral fissure um, of the frontal lobe is where taste and smell are. We call that the gustatory cortex. So taste and smell are kind of right next to each other on the underside of the prefrontal cortex in what we call the insular area. Uh, sometimes it's called the insula, I-N-S-U-L-A. Some people call it the gustatory cortex and gustatory means taste. But taste and smell are located right next to each other and they're basically uh, working in succession with one another. That's also why, if you've ever noticed, if you have a cold or if you plug your nose, you can still taste bitter and you can still taste sweet and sour, um, but you can't actually get the flavor of things and it's because taste and smell work together. So what about the rest of the prefrontal cortex? Well, that's what allows us to make decisions. It allows us to take the five senses and coordinate them together into one big picture. Um, it helps us to make decisions and plan out our days. Um, the fact that I can say after this, I have office hours, um, virtual, uh, and things like that are, um, and coordinating everything else, putting visual information and auditory information together when watching a movie. Um, and all of those things. It also controls our emotions. It inhibits our behavior so that we don't just yell out in class or throw things at the professor. Thank you very much for not throwing things at me. Um, now it would be a lot harder to try to do that. Um, and things like that. So the frontal lobe is basically everything else. It's motor control, it's decision making, it's um, coordinating memories, coordinating emotions, coordinating the senses, and making decisions based on those things. Um, yeah, and as you can tell, the precentral and postcentral gyrus uh, are almost basically twins of each other. And that's because once we feel something in the sense of touch, um, it goes right next door to the motor cortex so that we can respond to it. So let's just say, and uh, hopefully you can mentally picture this, somebody's grabbing your arm and you can hear my sound effect of me grabbing my own arm. Uh, so they grab your arm and right away you want to pull your arm away. The motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex or precentral and postcentral gyrus are both um, coordinating the same muscles. So when you feel somebody touching your arm, and you're pulling that part of your arm away, uh, it's instant because those two um, gyri are basically sharing the information right away. So it's uh, very useful for survival function and things like that. Come on, why? There we go, whoops, we skipped one because my computer is being very slow and I have no idea why, it's probably overloaded. So let's see. Bear with me, now it's going the opposite way. Nope, I want 11. Why are you not giving me 11? There we go, hey everybody. To the frontal lobe, as I just talked about. Movement and complex human capabilities. The motor cortex, as we just talked about, is found on the precentral gyrus, and it controls our voluntary movement. We do have some involuntary movements and secondary motor areas of the cortex, which is in an area underneath called the basal ganglia, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so Broca's area, as we've already talked about, is very important for speech production, but not for understanding speech. And that's why it's located next to the motor cortex. So it controls our muscles so we can make very precise sounds that people understand. The prefrontal cortex is everything else. It is involved in planning, impulse control decision making. When people are addicted to drugs, um, a lot of times the prefrontal cortex is inhibited and shut down a little bit. So this idea of um, controlling your impulses is gone in people with, uh, that are addicted to drugs. And um, as we sort of talked about in chapter five, and um, they might just do anything in order to get that drug. Um, with, uh, before we had drugs that controlled, or medications, I guess you could say, those are also drugs, of course, that controlled what we, um, you know, symptoms of our behavioral disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar and things like that. 
psychosis. Um, people were just either sort of chained to buildings or thrown into a um, mental asylum. But in the 1930s and 40s, there was a doctor, a neurosurgeon, who uh, sort of perfected a technique to um, cut the prefrontal cortex off from the rest of the brain so that you know people didn't act unruly and they were able to live within society. And that was called a lobotomy. In a lobotomy, which I will uh, provide the link for if you have the stomach to watch it, um, basically they went in through and cut the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain by using an ice pick and a chisel and basically going in through the eye, around the eye socket and into the brain above the nose where the prefrontal cortex is. Um, and there were thousands of those done so that people who were disruptive in society would basically lumber around like zombies. Um, Nowadays, uh, we have medication that can treat it a lot better, or if we know parts of the brain that are specifically um, in need of repair or have a bleed or things like that, we use what we call psychosurgery or neurosurgery to treat certain disorders. Um, these days, if somebody has really bad epilepsy and they have too many seizures, as we talked about, too much glutamate in the brain, um, that we go into the corpus callosum, which um, connects the information between the two hemispheres and we simply or they simply um, cut through the corpus callosum and cut off that connection and it takes some of the activity of the brain away although it is a negative in that the two hemispheres don't share information so easily if at all uh, it saves the people from overactivity and the seizures Parietal lobe, again, located behind the central sulcus and just behind the frontal lobe, is important for your body sensations because it tells your body where we are in space, um, as well as the sense of touch overall being processed here. Attention, so that we can pay attention to certain things. Our perception of the world, as well as spatial localization. Again, knowing where you are within your environment. Um, the main portion of this um, lobe is called the uh, postcentral gyrus or the somatosensory cortex. Um, as we'll talk about in chapter 11, there's a primary and a secondary somatosensory cortex. So the primary is where the information goes first. So this processes our skin senses, which include touch, temperature, and pain, our body position, knowing what position our body is in, and movement. And of course, your um, posture, as well as your vestibular system, which is your balance system, which coordinates with your inner ear. So if anybody's ever had an inner ear infection and you haven't been able to balance, you get really dizzy. That's because um, some of those portions from the inner ear that have to do with body positioning and balance go to the parietal lobe of the brain. And now you know. Here we see there are association areas within the parietal lobe. We'll find association areas within all of the lobes, actually. Um, and this way, these association areas can combine information from the other senses and from the other lobes. Although everything is coordinated in the prefrontal cortex, we also see some coordination. As I said, between the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe, we have coordination of visual and auditory inputs for language, which we'll talk about in chapter nine. Um, in the parietal lobe, we are combining um, visual association areas and the body senses to know where we are and how far away we are from things. Um, the ability to identify objects by touching them. We don't necessarily have to see it, but we can, we can see it and we can touch it and we know what it is. I can tell when something is a pencil or a pen based on its shape uh, without even opening my how far I have to reach over in order to get it. That calculation of how far away I am from an object 
takes both visual and um, these association areas in the parietal lobe of knowing how close or far away I am from that object. In the posterior, in the back part of the parietal lobe, um, damage in that area just above the um, occipital lobe um, causes a problem. It causes a disorder called neglect, which is usually hemi-neglect because it's usually only in one side of the brain. And what that means is the patient is unaware of the left side of space if it occurs in the right side of the brain. Most of the cases of neglect or hemi-neglect have been damaged to the right side of the brain, which means, and the person doesn't even know this is happening, they'll be unaware, they don't uh, see the left side of space. So people who have had right posterior parietal cortex damage, I give them, or not me, but the researcher or the psychologist gives them a picture of a clock or a house, and they may draw the entire clock, the entire circle, but they're only going to show the numbers from 12 to 6 and none of the numbers on the left-hand side. It's like their brain just ignores the whole left side of space and they think that they see the whole thing. Very strange and very interesting. Come on. My computer doesn't like me right now, apparently. Let's see. There we go. In the temporal lobe, it is separated from the frontal parietal lobes, as I said, uh, by this big um, area called a fissure. It is the lateral fissure. And um, the temporal lobe itself is the one on the bottom side that kind of sticks out like a thumb. And it contains, the main things that it contains is the auditory cortex, as you see there in pink, um, which is where sound or the auditory system is processed. So anything that we hear is processed in the auditory cortex. And right below, behind that is Wernicke's area. Uh, and Wernicke's area is um, speech comprehension. So uh, Wernicke's area is involved in language comprehension and, produ and production. So damage to Wernicke's area results in meaningless speech, like I said, purple monkey dishwasher, uh, and poor comprehension of not just spoken language, because you may think because it's next to the auditory cortex, it's just spoken language. But no, remember that we are coordinating written and spoken language. So people with damage to Wernicke's area, and this is important, right, uh, will not only be able to understand, not be able to understand spoken language, but they won't be able to understand written or gestured. So sign language they wouldn't understand or wouldn't understand what they're reading. They may be able to repeat the words that they read, but they won't be able to understand what it means. That's what happens with damage to Wernicke's area. Um, remember, we talked about superior and inferior. So on the bottom side, where it doesn't have a designated area, the bottom gyrus or gyri of the um, temporal lobe is the inferior temporal cortex. And that's actually concerned with visual identification. So if there is damage to the bottom part of that auditory cortex, the bottom gyrus, then people will have difficulty in recognizing objects. Um, that is part of something in the visual system we call the what stream, being able to identify what something is. Um, so we'll get to that a little later. Come on. All right. The last one is the easiest one because it only has, like I said, one job. <laughs> so see how I started there and I worked my way backwards? The occipital lobe is in the posterior or very back of the brain, right above your cerebellum. Um, and uh, it is, uh, it, what is located in the occipital lobe is the visual cortex, which contains a map of our visual space. Um, from the eye, this information is sent to the brain. And so we have adjacent receptors in the eye that send information to those exact adjacent points in the brain. That with the columns and rows is why information is so easily um, processed by the brain, because we need to process it in milliseconds right, to be able to understand what we're doing. 
In the next section, um, module three, we'll, after chapter six, we'll talk about how information is deconstructed and individual puzzle pieces are sent up to the brain. And when this information gets to the brain, it puts the puzzle back together instantaneously. So um, it makes uh, the job a lot easier when the receptors in the eye or the ear and the brain are adjacent. So in this case for vision, it's in the back of the eye, the retina, and the um, visual cortex. Of course, there are other visual areas that are doing things like helping to see color, movement, um, recognize specific shapes, color, form, you know, all of those things. And those are secondary visual areas, kind of like we have in the parietal lobe, that process individual components of the scene. So certain clusters of cells will be looking at the outline or shape of things. Certain ones will be looking at um, high versus low resolution. Certain ones will be looking at the different, uh, processing the different colors. Uh, another area is processing motion, seeing something go back and forth in a background that doesn't move, right? Or maybe it does. Um, let's see. Come on, come on, come on, yeah. Okay, and then um, below the cortex, but above the brainstem, and not quite in the midbrain, we have subcortical structures, which means below the cortex, um, before, below the outside of the cortex. So underneath, you can see things in this picture, like on top of the brainstem, there's a little area, um, and the uh, label is pointing at the top of this picture called the thalamus. The thalamus is there for processing four of the five senses and also um, arousal, uh, part of the arousal system. This works in two ways. One, it is taking four of the five senses, except for the sense of smell, which seems to go straight up from the nose right above it to the, you know, gustatory cortex or the insula and processing smell. The other four senses need to be coordinated. So information from the eyes through the thalamus to the visual cortex, from the ears through the thalamus to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. The thalamus is the relay station for four of these five senses and makes sure that the appropriate signals, the appropriate senses, are processed in the appropriate areas of the brain. It is our arousal system for two reasons. One, it amplifies the signal to make sure that the brain gets the signal that we have. Remember we talked in chapter two about the fail-safe of myelinated axons, making sure that the signal is just as strong at the end as it was at the beginning. Well, the thalamus is kind of that for the overall signal to get to the brain structures it needs to. So not only does it relay the um, senses to their appropriate place, but it also amplifies the signal to make sure we get it, both on the way up and on the way back down to the muscles if the brain has a response for this. Um, again, the only one that does not go through the thalamus is the sense of smell. So touch, taste, vision, and audition or hearing are the ones that go through the thalamus. Smell does not. Right below the thalamus, oh, sorry, I realized that the secondary reason for the arousal system is that there um we talked about in neurotransmitters, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine actually goes through the brainstem up to the thalamus. So that's where the norepinephrine uh, neurons sort of synapse. And that is responsible for the levels of arousal, how awake and alert or how tired and sleepy you are. And that goes through the thalamus as well. So that's where the second part of that arousal comes from. The hypothalamus which again is not exciting because it's just named as the structure of basically little nuclei um, that make up this area right below the thalamus. So you can see the hypothalamus um, is kind of diagonally below the thalamus, right near the midbrain. And the hypothalamus is involved in what I call the five Fs. Um, it is responsible for Fahrenheit because it is temperature control. And so that works as an F. And the other four Fs are fight or flight. It's in charge of the fight or flight response by the autonomic nervous system. It's in charge of letting us know when we are hungry or thirsty. So feeding and drinking. So we have Fahrenheit, we have fight, flight, we have feeding and drinking. 
And of course, the uh, hypothalamus is also in charge of our other hormonal systems, which includes our sex hormones. So the other F stands for fornication. Let's go with that. Or you can say sex. The other F word, you know, you can open that up to your own interpretation. So the hypothalamus is our emotional system. It controls um, our emotions as well as our motivations, which includes hunger and thirst, because we all know that if we don't get our food in a proper amount of time, we can get hangry, which is a combination of hungry and angry. So eating and drinking when we are hungry and thirsty, um, temperature control, if we get a little hot, we start to sweat. If we get a little cold, we start to shiver and that can start to warm us up. Um, and it's in control of our sex hormones. So Fahrenheit, fight flight, feeding and drinking and fornication. Um, behind that, you see um, a little area on the other side of the thalamus, right above the cerebellum, called the pineal gland. This is where Rene Descartes, if you remember back from chapter one, called the seat of the soul, where he thought, um, in that dualistic point of view, he thought that animal spirits came in through the pineal gland um, to control the mind portion of our brain. Like I said, nowadays, 99 plus percent of neuroscientists and researchers uh, know that we, this is all material because everything is connected. And uh, this has been rejected, Descartes' seat of the soul, through simple empiricism, because we now know that what the pineal gland is useful for is that it makes us sleepy because it secretes melatonin and regulates our daily rhythms. What other structures do we see here? Um, well, we see the corpus callosum, right? About, uh, right below the frontal lobe that is connecting the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Do we know what cut this is? Oh, you guys are really good. Of course, I'm recording this alone, but yes, this is a sagittal or mid-sagittal cut because you are seeing one hemisphere of the brain. Um, here on the top side, we can see the frontal lobe and parietal lobe. We see the pineal gland, the corpus callosum, and underneath the corpus callosum, we see that there's a couple holes in the brain. These holes are areas in the middle of the brain that allows that cerebrospinal fluid to flow through. That cerebrospinal fluid is uh, the fluid that protects the inside and outside of the brain, as well as bringing in nutrients and taking some waste materials, dead cells and things like that, out of the brain. Um, so that is our cerebrospinal fluid, and it th flows through four ventricles, which we'll get into. Um, the lateral ventricles, uh, which are the ones that are shown, one on each hemisphere, uh, there are two of them. So there's no such thing as a second ventricle. There are two lateral ventricles. Then there is a third and a fourth ventricle through which the system flows kind of like a fountain that recirculates cerebrospinal fluid. Underneath that, we see the thalamus and hypothalamus. Um, and right uh, uh, sort of attached to the hypothalamus, right below it, is the pituitary gland, which is the master gland of the hormone system or the endocrine system. In this um, system, the hypothalamus is in charge of our hormones and it tells the pituitary gland, hey, we're hungry. So, you know, send those hunger hormones out. Hey, we're thirsty. Hey, it's sexy time. Send out the sex hormones. Or, in the fight or flight case, hey, we need adrenaline, tell the adrenal gland to start flowing adrenaline or releasing adrenaline. So the pituitary gland is the one that sends the commands out. Okay, um, adrenal glands, we need adrenaline. Okay, um, we need to regulate blood sugar. Okay, we need to send out sex hormones. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And when it's time to stop, hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland, pituitary gland says, okay, it's time to stop producing um, hormones. It's time to stop producing adrenaline. So adrenal gland, turn it off. Um, and it's a whole feedback loop. We also see the cerebellum. We see the occipital lobe. You cannot see the, uh, the temporal lobe because what we see is the midline here. So we would see medial in the brain. This is along the medial line. We can't see the lateral side. So you wouldn't be able to see the temporal lobe here, but you can see the occipital lobe in the back. Um, you can see the brainstem. We have the pons, which is um, white myelinated axons of the motor system going from the motor cortex down to the spinal cord. Uh, 
so it's coordinating our movement. We see the medulla, which is coordinating our heartbeat and breathing, the most primitive um, activities in order for survival when you're first born. Um, the two things before you even latch on to mama that you need to have in order to survive is a heartbeat and you need to be able to breathe oxygen. The spinal cord below it, of course, is coordinating all the information going up to the brain from the five senses, or from at least the sense of touch, sorry, and all the information going down to the muscles. Cerebellum is coordinating our movements. It has to do with unconscious information processing as well. We'll talk about that in chapter 12. And uh, specific coordination of movements, being able to walk or coordinate to do a dance move or ride a bike. The cerebellum is working with the motor cortex in that sense. And then we see a little part of the brain that's outlined kind of in a perforated uh, dotted line, and that's the midbrain. The midbrain is made up of two parts. Um, the one that you see are two little bumps um, that are called the superior and inferior colliculi, and they're two little nuclei or two little bumps, the superior on top, inferior on the bottom. Um, superior is involved in the um, visual system, which we'll get into in chapter 10, and the inferior colliculi, because there's more than one of them, one on each side. Uh, one is a colliculus, more than one are colliculi. The inferior colliculi are part of the auditory system, going from the ear to the auditory cortex. Uh, the bottom of the midbrain, although you don't see it, um, and it's not labeled, is called the tegmentum. Tegmentum means floor. By the way, the superior and inferior colliculi together are called the tectum, T-E-C-T-U-M, and tectum means roof in Latin. So the roof of the midbrain is the colliculi, and the floor of the midbrain is what we call the tegmentum. If that word tegmentum seems familiar, it's because we talked about it in chapter five as the ventral tegmental area or VTA, which is where those dopamine neurons that go to the pleasure center, which you can see right above the hypothalamus, is called the nucleus accumbens right there, um, below the lateral ventricle and above the hypothalamus, kind of to the left of the thalamus. That's the nucleus accumbens, which is our pleasure or reward center of the brain. And I think I have gotten to every single structure on this outline, so you're welcome. Um, just a couple more slides before we continue uh, onto the next lecture, if my computer will let me. Let's go to 17, people. There we go. So what's not pictured here is our limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain. Um, in this case, uh, it's part of or controlled with in succession with the hypothalamus are a couple other structures, such as the hippocampus, which is Latin for seahorse. You would see that in um, maybe a different cut uh, in one of the coronal cuts, perhaps. It is the place for short-term memory storage. So where, when we are creating new memories that need to be stored long-term, in temporary short-term storage, they are stored in the hippocampus. This is on the inside of the temporal lobe, which is why that I said a couple slides ago that the temporal lobe is also involved in memory. Um, this is also in succession in, uh, of knowing where our body parts are in space, knowing where we are spatially. So being able to navigate um, our world, our environment, is the hippocampus. Um, we also talked about the hippocampus in chapter five when we said that it takes into account the environment in which we're in when we're doing a drug. So that's why people get tolerant to the same place, right? We talked about the drug den and um, if they went to someplace new and the hippocampus is not familiar with it, internal GPS, that's what leads to um, that overdose. So that is the hippocampus. In the amygdala, that is our, uh, basically next to the hippocampus is our fear and rage center of the brain. And that is controlling those emotions. So when we are scared or when we are angry or a combination of the both, um, that is the amygdala. The other thing that is not um, pictured are three sort of nuclei that make up the secondary motor center of the brain right underneath the frontal lobe called the basal ganglia. And they generate smooth movement of muscles 
um, and they coordinate things, um, coordinate different movements of the smooth muscles like heartbeat um, of the cardiac muscle and things like that. And that is a secondary motor center in the brain working in succession with the um, primary motor cortex. So the basal ganglia are made up of three nuclei um, and you don't need to know what they're called right now um, or maybe even at all in this class, but that is um, the ones that are not pictured underneath in the forebrain, just under the cortex. So let's see where that takes us. That takes us two more delays. Come on. There we go. Um, I think when we talk about development, and again, we can't see the picture here, but if you were to go to chapter three notes um, below that I give my um, online class, you'll be able to see the picture because it was, or at least one that's close to it. Um, it looks at how the neural tube, which becomes the forebrain, midbrain, and high brain, hind brain, um, the interior is hollow and that becomes these holes or ventricles that we use for cerebrospinal fluid to flow through. The things that the uh, the things that flow through, that stuff that flows through the ventricles, the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, is um, a fluid that, again, protects our brain on the outside because it allows it to um, not hit up against our skull. And inside, it also is carrying material from blood vessels to the central nervous system and any sort of trash or waste, dead brain cells, things like that, um, it carries it out of the central nervous system. So that's why, again, a bigger brain does not necessarily mean better because if your brain is too big and it's pushing on your skull, then you may have what's called hydrocephalus, which is too much cerebrospinal fluid in the brain and you may need to get it drained in order to function normally. So a bigger brain does not mean a better brain, but a more wrinkly brain is an absolute compliment. So really quickly, if my computer will allow, and it's going nice and slow. I think we're going to stop here, but um, yeah, let's, I guess, go with the midbrain and then we'll, we'll take it from there. So the midbrain, again, if we were to zoom in, we see the bumps of the inferior and superior colliculi, inferior colliculus, superior colliculus. You can see there's one on each side of the brain, um, right below the thalamus, and you can see the pineal gland in this picture. Um, what's not pictured uh, in here, this, by the way, secondary roles in vision audition and helps with movement. Um, when we talk about Parkinson's disease um, and lack of movement from that, that is due to deterioration of cells in um, the midbrain and basal ganglia area or going from the midbrain to the basal ganglia. Um, and that's what is happening in Parkinson's. Um, the reticular formation is those set of bundle of nerves um, or bundle, it's a tract, I guess, uh, that contains norepinephrine that's going from the hindbrain up to the thalamus, which is sitting on top of the midbrain, and that's controlling our levels of arousal. What we can't see is um, an area at the top called substantia nigra which means black substance. Those are basically the uh, dopamine neurons and they are coming from that ventral tegmental area, which is the bottom above, just above the pons right there. So we're going to stop here um, because that's a lot of my voice and a lot of slides that we've gone over and a lot of information. So when we continue, we will do the last 15 slides or so. Um, and we'll explain the rest. Uh, I will explain the rest of the brain in chapter three. Thank you for listening, and I will be in contact very soon.